They were two very different godfathers, separated by 4,000 miles of ocean. John Gotti was the Teflon Don, a New York mobster who adored public attention and defied lawmen to get him. Toto Riina was a peasant from rural Sicily, a boss who operated in the shadows. In the late 80s and early 90s, it required two very different approaches to bring them to justice. In the United States, crime fighters were tireless in their pursuit of Gotti. You disregard my phone calls, I'll blow you in the house up. In Sicily, it would take a revolution by the people of Palermo to put Rina behind bars. John Gotti was a violent and reckless hoodlum from his earliest days. Henry Hill, a young gangster, was drinking in a bar when he first came across the teenage Gotti. All of a sudden, God comes in that does it. Work anyway, goes over to the card table and starts whacking the guy with a batter or something, with a batter and pipe or something. Just beating his head to death. He almost killed the guy. And he, he might have killed the guy. I don't know. The guy might have died in you know, the trunk that night. I don't know. Gotti had broken an unwritten rule of the mob. Violence should only be used when there are no witnesses. He walks over and apologizes to me. <laughs> Completely all over the place. That was the first time I've ever, I had ever seen him. Yeah, he had a long black, uh, you know, top coat, leather, leather top coat, you know. I mean, he, he just looked like a part of a, you know, of uh, a gangster. It was clear Gotti feared no one. To Henry Hill, it marked Gotti as a man destined for the top. He was a man on the rise. He was, you know, he, he had his own crew. You, you know, he was, he was going to be somebody. You know, you just knew it. I mean, he, he had that presence. But one man stood in the way of Gotti's rise, Paul Castellano. He was the head of the Gambino crime family, the most powerful of all the mafia families in the U.S. Castellano was an old-style hood, a mafioso who disguised his crimes behind a veneer of respectability. Paul wore two hats. He could mingle with lawyers, real estate, medicine and developers, doctors, talk their language. Then he wore his Gambino family hat, and he could sit there and discuss why this guy's got to get killed and say, okay, he's got to go. Gotti would have to eliminate Castellano to become boss. But Gotti was not the only one who wanted him out of the way. In 1983, President Ronald Reagan declared war on organized crime. The target was the Mafia's ruling body known as the Commission. On it sat Paul Castellano. Under America's tough anti-Mafia RICO legislation, crime fighters could prosecute Castellano and the other bosses for running a criminal enterprise, if they could prove the Commission was meeting. The commission was so secret, the only proof the FBI had was from 1957, when police raided an infamous mob gathering. Then, one morning in 1984, FBI agent Joe O'Brien received a call from a mole inside the mafia. He informed me that there was going to be what's known as a mafia commission meeting in a couple of hours. Uh, I didn't believe them, to be honest with you, because uh, this was pretty much unheard of. These guys cannot afford to meet. Um, it can be very incriminating to them. 
If the FBI could get a photograph of this meeting, it would help destroy the commission. O'Brien and fellow agent Andy Currens staked out this building, a small house on Cameron Avenue, Staten Island, that belonged to a relative of a senior mafia don. The agents hid in the back of an unmarked van a few hundred yards down the road. The van was right back here, right about where the white car is, right in front of the uh, 54 there. That's about uh, where we were parked. And we had a nice straight shot. There were no cars at that time. We had a straight shot down the, uh, down the street to 34 camera. So we sat there for uh, three hours, so about 4.30. And then they started coming out crime family by crime family. The top men in the Gambino, the Lucchese, the Colombo, and the Genovese families all emerged. Then finally our uh, long-awaited uh, guest of honor, if you will, uh, Paul Castellano came out. Castellano was the boss of bosses. It was like the king strutting out. You could almost envision a carpeted area. It was a real show of, of how the mob operates and mob protocol. It was very exciting. Uh, I don't know how Andy managed to keep the camera as still as he did. He used this shoulder right here as a tripod, and uh, I just didn't breathe uh, for the longest period of time. Castle wasn't in any, any big rush. Took a couple of puffs on the cigar and uh, got in the car and drove off. The photographs were dynamite. The FBI knew that such striking visual evidence was just the thing to put in front of a jury. In February 1985, the FBI seized all five members of the commission. Agents O'Brien and Currens arrested Castellano and drove him to FBI headquarters in Manhattan. Federal authorities and New York City and state law enforcement officials today announced one of the most important indictments of mafia bosses in this nation's history. In the car on the way to FBI headquarters, Castellano heard a radio news bulletin about the arrests. It was the beginning of the end of Castellano's reign. Made their move late last night. Among those now facing federal racketeering and extortion charges are Paul Castellano, head of the Gambino family. The key to the investigation was an electronic bug. He turned to Joe, I remember, and he says, is that true? Is that true? You listened to my private conversations. Prosecutors say the recordings are of superb quality. You could almost hear him, like, groan. The agents thought Castellano was squirming because they had taped his criminal conversations. But Castellano realized they had also learned about his secret affair with his young Colombian maid. This was very embarrassing to him. It's a little embarrassing to us, too, for that matter. He's almost like a little boy now, confessing this uh, something that he did was bad. He's not talking about it was bad that I murdered people or had on my authority people were murdered. It's it's I'm embarrassed because I had this relationship with this young woman who was my maid, you know, right under my wife's nose. This was a revelation a Mafia Don could not afford. He'd broken one of Mafia's most sacred rules. It was okay to maim and murder but not to publicly dishonor your wife. Castellano awaited trial where the photos would be key evidence. If the New York mob wanted to know what a mafia war was like, they needed to look no further than Sicily. Here, the Mafia's boss was Toto Riina, an elusive, psychopathic killer from the town of Corleone. Mm. 
Corleone was a mafia stronghold set high in the mountains of central Sicily. It was the place that gave its name to Marlon Brando's character in the film The Godfather. Green is cruelty earned him the name The Beast. Corleone had an unenviable reputation as a place where only the toughest mafiosi were born and bred. As one local anti-mafia fighter remembers. I once met a Corleone Mafia person and he looked me straight in the eye and said, listen, to be a real man you need to have spent a few years in jail. This is the philosophy of the Corleone Mafia. For them, going to jail is like a baptism. A Mafia member who hasn't been to jail isn't a real mafioso. Riina's crime family had seized control of the Mafia in a vicious war. In Palermo, in the early 80s, the streets were soaked with the blood of Rina's victims. During one six-month period, a body was found in the city every three days. Palermo's mayor was Leo Luca Orlando, elected to office promising to end such crimes. Even 20 years later, his courageous stand means he must have an armed guard 24 hours a day. Palermo was a city just living in silence and in dark. The way the citizens to avoid to be involved in these killings was to deny that the mafia uh, does exist. Just to say, we don't see, we don't speak, we don't hear, it's not our problem, they kill each other, there's no risk for us. If we don't speak about the mafia, we, we, we will never be killed. The man leading the hunt for Rina was an investigating magistrate named Judge Giovanni Falcone. He had grown up in a rough area of Palermo, where some of his schoolboy friends later became mafiosi. Unlike them, he had chosen to fight for the law rather than against it. From his headquarters in Palermo's Palace of Justice, Falcone had been battling the mafia for over a decade. In 1987, he enjoyed his greatest victory. In the Maxi trial, over 300 mafiosi have been sent to prison, their sentences totaling almost 3,000 years. It was the most stunning blow the Sicilian mafia had ever received. But Mafia boss Toto Rina had escaped the roundup. He remained free, running his criminal empire from an unknown hiding place. Falcone faced another danger, this one closer to home. He had few friends at the Palace of Justice. The people of Palermo stood on the sidelines, waiting to see who would come out on top. Falcone or the Mafia. Falcone rented a vacation apartment on the beach, half an hour's drive from Palermo. When he went there, it seemed that most of Palermo knew about it. When Falcone was on the move, it was like a wedding party. There were lots of cars, even a helicopter in the sky above. So everyone knew that Falcone was at the beach house. Yet the ring of steel that protected Falcone made little difference to Riina. One afternoon in June 1989, Falcone relaxed by the beach. An inquisitive security guard noticed the sports bag by the house, seemingly forgotten in the rocks by the water's edge. When he peered inside the bag, 
he noticed electric wires connected to 58 sticks of plastic explosives. The bag was wired to explode if it was picked up. The bomb did not go off. Falcone had cheated death. Soon after the assassination attempt, Falcone spoke to one of his closest friends in the fight against the mafia. He made a chilling prediction. Come lui diceva poi. When we were talking afterwards, he told me, my life's mapped out. It's my destiny to be killed by the Mafia someday. The only thing I don't know is when. With Rina at large, Falcone was running out of time. Back in New York, the clock was also ticking for the American godfather, Paul Castellano. Castellano waited for his trial on racketeering charges. He rarely ventured from his home, this luxurious mansion in the most exclusive area of Staten Island. Enemies and friends alike called it the White House and Castellano lived like a president. That meant he lost touch with feelings on the street. Discontent that would be exploited by his rival, John Gotti. There's a lot of uh, discontent with Castellano where they thought he was too involved in his legal trials. He wasn't running the family. It had become a family of the haves and have nots. Castellano was making all the money. Guys like Gotti were out there starving. So there was a lot of dissension in the family. We knew there was meetings going on and there was a lot of discontent. In fact, Gotti posed as a have-not to win support for his bid to become boss. In reality, Gotti was making a fortune dealing heroin, making him a hero to his supporters. The law was onto Gotti's crew for drug dealing. That brought more heat on Castellano. So he planned to break up Gotti's crew. Gotti knew he had to act. The stage was set for a showdown. On December 16th, 1985, Castellano headed into Manhattan for a meeting with Gotti. They were to meet here at Castellano's favorite steakhouse, Sparks, in Midtown Manhattan. Outside the restaurant, Castellano and his driver were shot dead. Such a daring public murder shocked New Yorkers. It made the new Gambino boss a celebrity overnight. At the time, Gotti was facing a trial on a charge of racketeering. Until the murder, few outside the world of law enforcement had even heard of Gotti. We went from having what was really kind of a not sleepy, but routine organized crime case to the case, the case of the decade. We had huge throngs of reporters outside the courthouse, in the courtroom. We had, we had a big fish on the line. At his trial, Gotti was defended by flamboyant mob lawyer Bruce Cutler. For many years, Cutler has continued to act as Gotti's apologist. He had a, a remarkable insight into others, uh, like a sense, almost a, 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 a sixth sense, if you will, to size people up. Gotti could certainly size up a jury. 
In March 1987, the trial reached its conclusion. Gotti was acquitted of racketeering. But unknown to law officers, a juror had been bribed by one of Gotti's men. Gotti was tried in two other cases, both for assault, both defended by Bruce Cutler. I'll say you with respect to defendant John Gotti, guilty or not guilty? You find him not guilty. Each time, the Gambino boss got off. Bribery and intimidation of witnesses saw to that. The nickname, the Teflon Don, was born. Gotti was different from almost any other godfather. He made little secret he was a mafia Don and enjoyed that everyone knew he'd risen from Brooklyn poverty to become the boss of bosses. He was born dirt poor, was on the street since he's 12, was on the cover of Time magazine in his 40s, and he took on the system. In the opinion of his former attorney, Gotti was a modern-day Robin Hood, standing up to those in power. Jewish people, uh, Irish people, working people, union people, construction workers, policemen. My father was a detective. Some of our strongest supporters that used to cheer for us were local police, not because they're allowed to, but it was the alphabetized government thugs we fought. The FBI, Internal Revenue, INS, CIA, those faceless, robotic government thugs that come at you and can destroy your life. The murderous reality of Gotti's brutal reign was very different. Gotti's love of public adoration would be exploited by the FBI and proved to be the Teflon Don's undoing. American mob boss John Gotti loved the limelight, but the head of the Sicilian mafia, Totorina, stayed out of sight. Prosecutor Giovanni Falcone was determined to hunt him down. Falcone needed a way of connecting Mafia boss Reina to the crimes carried out in his name by his army of killers. The answer was in America. Richard Martin was a leading official in the U.S. Department of Justice. He and Falcone had worked together for years. Their biggest success breaking the heroin smuggling link between Sicily and the United States, known as the Pizza Connection. Falcone relished his trips to the U.S. The life that he led in Sicily um, was almost the life of a prisoner. He went from a bulletproof car to a protected office. Instead, when he came to New York, uh, he could go shopping, he could go to restaurants, um, he could come to our offices, we could go to our homes and meet our families uh, together. And so for him, New York was uh, like freedom. Falcone's visits to New York were for more than pleasure. He had been impressed by America's tough anti-mafia laws. Laws that allowed the U.S. government to target mafia boss Paul Castellano and to bust the commission. I think it also liberated his thinking uh, and, and allowed him to sort of see beyond his own sort of realm coming here. So I think he not only enjoyed it, but I think it was very good for his uh, vision of the way that he was going to attack the mafia and uh, the way in which he would work with Italian law enforcement. In 1991, a new justice minister took office in Rome, determined to finally crush the Mafia. He offered Falcone a job at the ministry as overlord of the anti-Mafia campaign throughout Italy.
Falcone jumped at the chance of leaving Palermo and putting into practice the lessons he had learned in the United States. His ideas were revolutionary. An Italian equivalent of the FBI was to be formed. Across Italy, the fight against organized crime would be centralized under Falcone's control. Riina, the beast from Corleone, felt threatened. A few years before, he had failed to kill Falcone at his beach house. Now, Riina would try again. On May 23rd, 1992, Falcone and his wife, Francesca, returned to Palermo for the weekend. A few miles from the airport, several of Rina's men had placed a half-ton bomb in a drain pipe under the highway that ran from the airport to the city. The men hid in a building above the road armed with a remote-controlled detonator. A massive explosion ripped open the highway. The explosion was so enormous, it registered on local earthquake monitors. Giovanni's sister, Maria Falcone, was at home when she heard the news of the explosion. When my husband told me what had happened, I rushed out of the room. I phoned the police. They told me Giovanni had been taken to hospital. When I got there, Francesca's brother told me Giovanni's dead. This was the saddest moment ever. Not only for me as a sister, but also as an Italian citizen. Because we felt that in losing Giovanni, our greatest chance of beating the Mafia had gone. Falcone was not only a colleague, I was proud to think of him as a colleague, um, but a friend. Uh, I was enormously saddened. Uh, and it was as if um, a part of what we all worked with for had been lost. Riina reputedly threw a party, toasting Falcone's demise with champagne. Along with Falcone, his wife Francesca and three bodyguards were also killed. Thousands gathered at the church of San Domenico in Palermo for the funeral, waiting patiently for hours in the rain. The funeral was broadcast live on national TV. Across Italy, all regular television programs were suspended. Parliament declared a day of mourning. When they asked me what I did when I heard the news, I said I cried. Someone said, you're Judge Ferraro, what do you mean you cried? I replied, yes, I cried, and I'm not in the slightest bit ashamed of it. Italy was shocked and angered. It 
didn't deter Toto Riina, anyone who stood in his way would meet a similar fate. In New York, the net was closing in on American godfather John Gotti. This clothing store in Manhattan's Little Italy was once the Ravenite Social Club, the nerve center of the Gambino crime family operation. Gotti insisted that his crime family visit the Ravenite to pay public homage to him. The FBI had placed their surveillance team on a block near the Ravenite. This is some of the actual footage shot by the FBI. Gotti reveled in his public persona as Mafia Godfather. He made no attempt to hide the fact that he was meeting with his criminal gang. The rest of the family was required to come down there as a command performance to meet with John, discuss business, kiss his rear end, give him money, what have you. So during the course of the week, you might have all 20 caps in the family down there on different nights, plus 80 to 90 to 100 soldiers. All standing out there in broad daylight. And for us, it was a gold mine just seeing, identifying the entire Gambino family during the course of the week, all in one place. Pictures, though, were not enough. To get a conviction, the FBI also needed to hear Gotti talking about his crimes. They had bugged the Ravenite, but the mics had so far failed to pick up much. Then they had a break. An informant told them Gotti always held his most important meetings in an apartment upstairs, owned by the elderly widow of a Gambino member. When the old lady went on vacation, FBI agents broke in and placed a bug in the apartment. But a few days later, we heard the back door of the social club open up, and we heard him walking up the stairs, and sure enough, we hear the door, apartment number 10, open. And they all sit down, and they start talking. And after a few minutes, you know, it became obvious that uh, they weren't concerned about microphones because uh, they had a radio on, but they turned it down because it was too noisy. They all talked loud because we found out later John Gotti's deaf in one ear. So the tapes are all loud and clear and a tremendous quality. You tell this punk, I'm Nick John Gotti, and I will sever your mother head off. The secret recordings revealed the true face of a mafia godfather, very different from the one Gotti showed his adoring public. Listen, I called your house five times yesterday. Now, if you'll disregard my phone calls, I'll blow you in the house up. When John's upset, he starts talking loud and clear, and he forgets about things he should not talk about, like past murders. Gotti was arrested. In January 1992, he was sent to trial, facing charges of multiple murder and racketeering. It would be his fourth trial in six years. Yet again, New York was riveted by John Gotti. Celebrities flocked to the trial. The gallery, it was almost a circus-like atmosphere. Um, Mickey Rourke came in one day. Um, Anthony Quinn came in to watch the trial. They sent in a boxer, Ronaldo Snipes, who glowered at the jury and within half an hour was kicked out. John, listen, I call your house five times yesterday. Now, if you'll disregard my... Phone calls, I'll blow you in the house up. Gotti was his normal cocky self, you know, he's full of bravado. But when you played those tapes, you watch his face, and you knew that's the last thing you wanted to hear was his big mouth. You tell this punk, I'm Nick John Gotti, and I sever your mother head off, you Gotti had damned himself, but the tapes would have another unexpected impact. Also arrested with Gotti was his loyal right-hand man, Sammy the Bull Gravano. 
Dominic Montiglio went to school with Gravano. Later, both men would become mobsters with the Gambino crime family. Sammy was always a tough kid. He and I went to, to school together from when we were like in kindergarten. I mean, he killed his brother-in-law. You know, um, Louis, which was like his childhood friend. I mean, you know, Louis Melito. They grew up together and hung out together. They stole together. They did all of that. He killed Louis. Um, you couldn't trust Sammy. Gravano had become disillusioned with Gotti. To Gravano, a real godfather shouldn't be courting publicity. He should be operating in the shadows, like Paul Castellano had done. But Gotti had no respect for anyone, including his underboss, something that the FBI exploited. At a pretrial hearing, agent Bruce Mao played Gotti and Gravano a tape. On it, Gotti was extremely critical of his underboss. And so you got Gravano and Gotti sitting side by side by side at the defense table, and we start playing that tape. And Sammy turns red; he's starting to explode. He's just ready to burst. John Gotti, for the first time, is embarrassed. He's turning white. He just wants to duck under the table. He's so embarrassed because he knows he got caught bad, bad mouth in his consigliere, his underboss, his right-hand man. Gravano would be the final nail in Gotti's coffin. Bruce calls me one day at my desk. He says to me, are you sitting down? I said, yes, I'm sitting down. He said, Sammy wants to cooperate. Sammy was brought in the room. He walked over, shook my hand, and said, I want to go from our government to your government. Never before had so senior a figure betrayed the American mob. Gravano's testimony landed the killer blow in court. He revealed how he and Gotti had planned the murder of their one-time boss, Paul Castellano, then watched from a car as Castellano was gunned down. Gravano was a fantastic witness, and John Gotti acted like someone who knew he was going to be convicted, and he was really worried about it. He was ornery, snapping at me, uh, snapping at his lawyers. It was, uh, I enjoyed watching it. In April 1992, Gotti was found guilty on 13 charges, including murder and racketeering. The judge sent the Godfather to one of the toughest jails in the U.S., Marion Federal Penitentiary in Marion, Illinois. The sentence was steep, life without the possibility of parole. Despite the evidence of the tapes and Gravano's testimony, Gotti's attorney in his first three trials still protest Gotti's innocence. If you're asking me do I agree with the label that he was boss of some Gambino group, I say no to you. I've said no all my life. He said no. I don't say he was an altar boy or a saint. He was one tough cookie. But he said he was not part of any mob. In the United States, the mob boss, John Gotti, was facing a life sentence in prison. But in Sicily, the Italian government seemed powerless. Mafia godfather Toto Riina killed at will. Anti-mafia prosecutor Giovanni Falcone had been murdered. Palermo waited anxiously for Riina's next move. Falcone's mantle had fallen to another magistrate, Paolo Borsellino. Borsellino and Falcone had grown up together and had devoted their adult lives to fighting organized crime. On Sunday afternoon, July 19th, 1992, two months after the murder of Falcone, Borsellino visited his elderly mother in this apartment block as he did every weekend. A massive car bomb exploded, killing Borsellino and five of his bodyguards. Thank you. 
This outrage was the final straw. It caused a revolution against the Mafia, led by the people of Palermo. After the killing of Paolo Borsellino, the reaction of people, the population in Palermo was enormous. The women, the children, the people reacted, just crying, basta, no more, enough is enough. Enough was enough. Thousands poured onto the streets of Palermo in a wave of anger unprecedented in Sicilian history. Everyone sensed the Mafia's next target was Mayor Leo Luco Orlando, elected to office pledging to rid Palermo of the Mafia. When he appeared in public, women and children threw a protective cordon around him, daring the Mafia to kill them to get to the mayor. They send a clear message. The message was that I was not alone. The message was that the Mafia can kill a man. The Mafia can kill 10 men. But the mafia cannot kill thousands and thousands of women and children. It was the beginning of the hand. People power had beaten down the mafia. The government flooded Sicily with thousands of troops, determined to crack down hard on the mafia. In January 1993, Italian police nabbed the biggest prize of all. Following a tip-off, Toto Riina was finally arrested. Salvatore Riina was captured in Palermo by the Carabinieri this morning. Toto Rina is ours. Astonishingly, Riina had been living in the middle of Palermo, undetected by the police for over 20 years. When Riina was paraded in public, Italians were shocked. This inoffensive looking, peasant like character was responsible for the brutal slayings of Falcone and Borsellino along with hundreds of others. At his trial, Riina painted himself as a poor old man who knew nothing about the Mafia. This flimsy defense was rejected. Riina was sentenced to life imprisonment to be served away from Sicily in a jail on the Italian mainland. On both sides of the Atlantic, the day of the Godfather seemed over. John Gotti died of cancer in prison in 2002, 10 years into his life sentence. With Gotti's death, an era ended. By publicly flaunting the fact that he was boss of bosses, he ensured that law enforcement agencies would leave no stone unturned to finally smash the mob. The future is pretty grim for the mob if the FBI and other federal agencies keep the pressure on to go after these guys. The biggest mistake we can make is declare that the war and the mob is over with, we've won, and go off to do other things. These people are very resilient. Five years, they could regroup, reorganize. They'll never be as effective what they were 30 years ago, but they still be a viable criminal force. In the U.S., the mob is moving with the times. They're involved in internet fraud, sex phone lines, and stock exchange scams. But they are no longer the power they once were. And the FBI is determined to not let Russian, Chinese, or other immigrant criminals dominate their neighborhoods in the way Italian gangsters once controlled theirs. In Sicily, they're also keeping the pressure on. 
Yet in these hills, even with Riina in prison, the mafia is still here. Invisible, but deadly. Today, there are new leaders. They are also from the mafia stronghold of Corleone. They have turned their backs on the self-defeating tactics of Total Riina. No longer do they assassinate public officials. Like the leaders of old, they prefer to pull the strings from the shadows. Forse vivemmo tutti quanti una vera grande illusione. Che I think we were all a bit deluded. Maybe we were just kidding ourselves that we could destroy the mafia with just four moves on a chessboard. In the US, the mob is finally in retreat. But in Sicily, it is rising from the ashes, adapting itself to the times, changing tactics to ensure that its power remains as unshakable today as it ever was. Gotti had broken an unwritten rule of the mob. Violence should only be used when there are no witnesses. He walks over, apologizes to me. <laughs> Complete play all over the place. That was the first time I've ever, I had ever seen him. You know, he had a long black, uh, you know, top coat, leather, leather top coat, you know. I mean, he, he just looked like a part of a, you know, of uh, a gangster. It was clear Gotti feared no one. To Henry Hill, it marked Gotti as a man destined for the top. He was a man on the rise. He was, you know, he, he had his own crew. You, you know, he was, he was going to be somebody, you know. You just knew it. I mean, he, he had that presence. But one man stood in the way of Gotti's rise, Paul Castellano. He was the head of the Gambino crime family, the most powerful of all the mafia families in the U.S. Castellano was an old-style hood, a mafioso who disguised his crimes behind a veneer of respectability. Paul wore two hats. He could mingle with lawyers, real estate, businessmen and developers, doctors, talk their language. Then he wore his Gambino family hat and he could sit there and discuss why this guy's got to get killed and say, okay, he's got to go. Gotti would have to eliminate Castellano to become boss. But Gotti was not the only one who wanted him out of the way. In 1983, President Ronald Reagan declared war on organized crime. The target was the Mafia's ruling body known as the Commission. On it sat Paul Castellano. Under America's tough anti-Mafia RICO legislation, crime fighters could prosecute Castellano and the other bosses for running a criminal enterprise. If they could prove the Commission was meeting. The commission was so secret, the only proof the FBI had was from 1957, when police raided an infamous mob gathering. Then, one morning in 1984, FBI agent Joe O'Brien received a call from a mole inside the mafia. He informed me that there was going to be what's known as a mafia commission meeting in a couple of hours. Uh, I didn't believe them, to be honest with you, because uh, this was pretty much unheard of. These guys cannot afford to meet. Um, that can be very incriminating to them. If the FBI could get a photograph of this meeting, it would help destroy the commission. And uh, got in the car and drove off. The photographs were dynamite. 
the FBI knew that such striking visual evidence was just the thing to put in front of a jury. In February 1985, the FBI seized all five members of the commission. Agents O'Brien and Currens arrested Castellano and drove him to FBI headquarters in Manhattan. Federal authorities and New York City and state law enforcement officials today announced one of the most important indictments of mafia bosses in this nation's history. In the car on the way to FBI headquarters, Castellano heard a radio news bulletin about the arrests. It was the beginning of the end of Castellano's reign. Made their move late last night. Among those now facing federal racketeering and extortion charges are Paul Castellano, head of the Gambino family. The key to the investigation was an electronic bug. He turned to Joe, I remember, and he says, is that true? Is that true? You listened to my private conversations. Prosecutors say the recordings are of superb quality. You could almost hear him, like, groan. The agents thought Castellano was squirming because they had taped his criminal conversations. But Castellano realized they had also learned about his secret affair with his young Colombian maid. This was very embarrassing to him. It's a little embarrassing to us. O'Brien and fellow agent Andy Currens staked out this building, a small house on Cameron Avenue, Staten Island, that belonged to a relative of a senior mafia don. The agents hid in the back of an unmarked van a few hundred yards down the road. The van was right back here, right about where the white car is, right in front of the uh, 54 there. That's about uh, where we were parked. And we had a nice straight shot. There were no cars at that time. We had a straight shot down the, uh, down the street to 34 camera. So we sat there for uh, three hours, so about 4.30. And then they started coming out crime family by crime family. The top men in the Gambino, the Lucchese, the Colombo, and the Genovese families all emerged. Then finally, our uh, long-awaited uh, guest of honor, if you will, uh, Paul Castellano, came out. Castellano was the boss of bosses. It was like the king strutting out. You could almost envision a carpeted area. It was a real show of, of how the mob operates and mob protocol. It was very exciting. Uh, I don't know how Andy managed to keep the camera as still as he did. He used this shoulder right here as a tripod, and uh, I just didn't breathe that, for the longest period of time. Castle wasn't in any, any big rush. Took a couple of puffs on the cigar. They were two very different godfathers, separated by 4,000 miles of ocean. John Gotti was the Teflon Don, a New York mobster who adored public attention and defied lawmen to get him. Toto Riina was a peasant from rural Sicily, a boss who operated in the shadows. In the late 80s and early 90s, it required two very different approaches to bring them to justice. In the United States, crime fighters were tireless in their pursuit of Gotti. In Sicily, it would take a revolution by the people of Palermo to put Rina behind bars. John Gotti was a violent and reckless hoodlum from his earliest days. Yes, 
Henry Hill, a young gangster, was drinking in a bar when he first came across the teenage Gotti. 